I'm going. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are very happy to see you, and this is a, the opening session to a series of webinars that will be huge. Uh, before we start, I want you to please uh, note that you have the option to have interpretation at the bottom of your screen. If you go to the bottom, there's a globe, and at the globe, if you click on it, you can choose French or English interpretation. Or if you disactivate it, you will hear the language in which the person is speaking with no interpretation. Um, I think we should start. So I will bring start my presentation, and then move on to we'll have presentations in this session and question and answer. Um, if you would like to, if you would like to, um, uh, I'll be, I'll go to my presentation. Uh, excuse me, Zainab, could you bring the microphone closer to your mouth, please? It's difficult to hear you. All right, there you go. Was there? All right, so the objectives of this, uh, the, the agenda for this meeting is First of all, to give you a welcome, I'm happy that you're here, and to give you some technical background, we'll be using a Zoom with the interpretation, and there are a couple of things that we wanted to highlight so that we can have some interaction uh, a little more smooth. And then we'll go through the objectives of the consultation. Uh, we'll take you to the survey, the participation, contents, etc. And then we will have a presentation from uh, Gaspar who is from the Slovenian National Commission and the chair for National Commission meetings for the advisory group for the OER Dynamic Coalition. We will have a presentation from the Dyke Sikar, who is the director of monitoring, from, uh, and she's in the Commonwealth of Learning. Excuse me, Zainab. Yes? Uh, we have a sound issue. There's background noise. It sounds like we can't hear you from the in the microphone again. So the interpreters are having great difficulty. Is this better? It, it's slightly better. Interpreters, is that better? On the English channel? I don't I know. Hello, unfortunately, I don't think it's the uh, it's the background it's issue. It's the microphone, I think, that's an issue. You think it's the microphone that's the issue? Have you yeah, still have you still I clicked still on the me. Zainab, can you click on the cask on your telephone again? Okay, just one second. Can you say a few words for us? Yes, can you hear me? Very badly. Can you say a few words again? Can you hear me now? No, it's not going through the microphone. Can you try uh, what you did this before during the test? This, I didn't do anything different. You clicked on the, you, you hit um, headset on your telephone. Yes, it's still, oh yes, it's here. There, is that better? Yes, much better. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, we'll start again. We will have the technical background. We'll have the objectives of the consultation survey. We'll have a presentation from Jasper Hestush, who's from the Senior National Commission, and he'll be speaking about the importance of governments and the activities of the Dynamic Co Coalition. We'll have a presentation from Alexi, Ms. Alexi Carr, who is from the Commonwealth of Learning, and she's the chair for monitoring. Another presentation from Neil Butch, who is from OER Africa, who, um, who will speak as the chair for communications, and then a discussion and conclusion. I would just like to highlight that uh, the, during the discussion, we'd like to ask you to please put your uh, well, the next slide will be easier. Oh, sorry, let me go in order. Objectives of this uh, discussion, there are two, and it's for the same throughout the whole week. The first one is to clarify the priority areas of action per working group. The idea is to drill down on the, on the uh, recommendations of the final report and see which are the areas that we should focus on as a priority in each uh, work group. The second is to drill down and identify activities and issues related 
to the establishment of an electronic tool for information sharing and collaboration between the dynamic coalition partners. So what would this tool serve to do? What would be some of the user needs that are necessary? How how are how can we best serve the community to make sure that this really supports collaboration, information exchange, and joint activities? So these will be the issues that will be addressed in each of the four working group sessions over the next three days. Now, um, I'm trying to change. Uh, just some technical points. If you want to speak and ask questions, please use the Q and box, not the chat, but the Q and A box. Uh, if you want to, uh, the chat uh, is uh, we we will be asking just to send you information, but we need is we in order to maintain some sort of form to the discussion, we need to work in chat. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we will have we will call on the on the. On, you, on the questions after the presentations. Finally, in terms of interpretations, as I mentioned earlier, if you click on this uh, icon, you will see that you can choose English or French interpretation. And in this regard, if you don't choose either and don't activate it, you will hear what is being said on the screen in the language that is being said. Also, the session is being recorded so that we will have some sort of uh, record of the different discussions that we could go back to if we need to just for the report. Um, I'm trying to change the screen, voila. In terms of the background to this discussion, as you know, and I think many of you were part of this discussion, we had the Dynamic Coalition launch in March 2020. And there was a final report, which is available online and which I sent to you with the invitation, the link to, in English and French. There was the establishment of the working groups and the working group leads. There was the survey, which was sent and which many of you uh, participated in. And this is now the consultation. In terms of the working groups, there are four thematic ones, capacity building, policy, inclusive, equitable, quality, OER, sustainability. There are four transversal working groups on communication, monitoring, liaison with national commissions, emerging technologies, and AI. Um, now to go to the survey, since this is going to be the background to our discussions over the next two days, I'm just going to let you know who responded. We had some 26 responses. Uh, I think uh, we had 31 responses, sorry. And they were 16 male, 15 female. And that's quite good because it's not a very large response. It was a shorter time period than, uh, the, it was available a shorter time period than the, the uh, Dynamic Coalition discussions in March. But it was a means to have a basis for our discussions all together today and this week. In terms of the responses by region, you have them on the screen here. You'll see that there were a lot of uh, responses from the Europe North America region, but there were also responses from the other regions, and that's very, very encouraging because it's important that uh, that uh, this is a really a global dynamic coalition and that we have voice of all regions present. Um, for the next days, we have the program is on your screen. As you can see, we have uh, the opening today. In the afternoon to this next, uh, tomorrow afternoon is sustainability, then quality inclusive multilingualism, policy, capacity building, and then a closing. If you want to register for other sessions, you may do so by just going to, uh, just going, I think you've already registered. When you register one time, you've registered for all of them, and you're welcome to come to this one or as many. There's one thing I should mention that if you give your um, your ID to someone else, they will come as you according to the system. So you might want to invite them to register directly themselves at the link which was sent earlier. Um, so the chairs of each of these sessions are the chairs for the advisory group and for the working group of the uh, in the OER Demic Coalition. And uh, for sustainability, it's Ms. Lisa 
Petries and Tel Emil for multi inclusive multilingualism. It's uh, Professor Bandeleria and uh, Papa Yuda Dieng from OEF. And policy, we have Jane France Agbu, who's the OER chair in Nigeria, and Maria Soledad. Uh, Ramirez Montea, who's the OER chair in Mexico and also the chair for policy. For capacity building, we have Dr. Jihan Osman in Egypt and Dr. Skander Genia, who is uh, at the Ministry of Education in Tunisia. Uh, and in the opening and closing, we have the chairs, uh, Gasper, as I mentioned earlier, Mitya and Alexi, and also, I'm sorry, I should put also that Neil Butcher will be speaking here also on communications. There's the chair. And Neil will be the reporter for the session altogether. So he'll be taking notes with his colleague Mohini, who's on this uh, call also. And uh, we hope to have the report of the meeting finished very soon after the meeting. Now, I need to change. Whoops. So, what are the next steps? What's the big picture? It's on your screen. Basically, we did the survey, having the online consultation. In September, based on the outputs of this, uh, integrating them into it, we'll be starting the development of a communication and collaboration system. We'll be launching projects in the areas of the working groups. And then we'll take stock of this sometime at the end of this year to make, to see that everything is on it. Um, so it's all, and to, we started this only in March. So um, we hope that this will be cool, fast enough. Now, there's one thing I want to just bring up in terms of the inputs to the survey and inputs to the different activities. It's not all the same people all the same times as the people who participate. Everybody was invited to participate, but I think there is a question of um, availability and we are all very busy. So there were a very large group who participated in the OER Demic Coalition launch, which went on for one month. It was a very extensive time. And it was also a very special time in the planet when uh, many, many countries were being locked down. Um, and then there was uh, the dynamic, uh, the consultation survey. The people who have participated in the survey are not all the same that participating in the consultation. So there is an overlap. And this is very good because it provides a means to have a different variety of views to have a uh, multiplicity of uh, ways forward. With that, I give the floor to Gasper, who will speak to you on the importance of national commissions. Yes, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, thank you, Zeynep. Uh, it's really Many of you uh, still remember me from from the overall process of the of the uh, for for the OER recommendation, and I can say from my point of view, and and this I think I, I am also um, somehow leading the transversal working group on on national commissions in this process, and um, here I would like really to to make a statement of what kind of importance it can be that national, not only national commissions, but, but also the governments of member states are involved in this overall process also now, and especially now during the implementation of the OER recommendation. Um, but I can say I, I experienced UNESCO for the last, I don't know, it could be 20 years already. And uh, I do not remember that any uh, recommendation that was adopted by by UNESCO's member states um, was um, pushed through such an open and inclusive process like like uh, in this case for the OER recommendation the overall start was uh, the start of the uh, cooperation among UNESCO our OER chair in Ljubljana and of course our national commission in the framework of the overall process uh, of the recommendation before its adoption. Also through the organization of the Second World OER Congress, which was of course not organized by the Slovenian National Commission, but it was hosted and also supported by the Slovenian Ministry of Education, Science and Sports. Um, so here we can see also, and Zeynep will confirm of course, and other colleagues can confirm like Mitya, um, that the process wasn't easy. It was uh, a four-year 
process and if we remember the, all the discussions uh, among diplomats and experts in the executive board sessions um, where we also okay we had we were lucky because Slovenia was at this time a member of the executive board but we have seen that also a small member state um, not a large and rich one like Germany or at this time still the US or other countries but a small tiny little country from southeastern uh, Europe uh, was able and strong enough to somehow push other uh, much larger member states to somehow see and confirm that this uh, process is uh, uh, worth enough that they that they um, support it and that they cooperate and I can see it now um, the way how it came up now the dynamic coalition we talked about it already during the, the world OER congress the ideas came up and now after the launch of the uh, dynamic coalition and I have checked okay I wasn't with you uh, through the time now after March but uh, I have promised not only to Zeynep, but also to myself, because I think it's really of big importance that also a, not an expert in the field of open education, but a representative of a UNESCO national commission. So a representative of a national government can be of, of um, added value also of, uh, for, for this uh, uh, for the success of this coalition and I agreed with with uh, with this and I see that it's really still worth because I can see what what uh, happens when also I don't know a ministry it's not in our case unfortunately but for example in Germany for the last years um, the OER movement receives still quite a nice amount of fundings for the development of OER, especially in Germany and German-speaking countries. And I think it's it's really important to, to stress this, that it's worth, I don't know, I will give the communication again to all national commissions uh, in, in this world. And, and some of them are listening to me. And I think that it, it came uh, over to all of you who are listening now to me uh, that that I still have this enthusiasm, and uh, I confirm and and I agree that it's that it's also for myself in a personal capacity um, of of a huge value to be part of this team. So for now, I would like to to thank you for your for your attention, and I will stay with you. Uh, um, as much as possible during during the consultations this week and thank you very much thank you gasper thank you very much um i will now have the floor to micha micha yermo who is the chair for emerging technologies and ai this is uh, just to let you know this field is specifically marked in the recommendation text as an area that has to be taken into account during the um, implementation of activities because it's important our work is forward-looking and takes into account technology that is coming in here. Nirmal, please go. Uh, uh, Micha, please go. So hi all. Um, I hope that you can hear me. Um, uh, so um, there is quite a lot of work that we did and uh, we are doing still in the area of how to actually ease uh, the use uh, the use of OER. So uh, what we find out um, in the course of the development uh, being involved in the OER uh, community is that, um, let me check if this works. Um, uh, trying to move slides for uh, uh, now. Can you go back, Neil? Is it me or is it you doing this? It's you. It's me. Trying to get back. Uh, you have to. You have to roll it with your your uh, your mouse. I'm doing that, but uh, it doesn't really work. 
Uh, Neil, can you take over? Uh -huh. I just... Can you can you go back, Neil, to uh, one slide? Back. One second. Yeah. Let's start from the beginning. Yeah, okay, so next slide. So uh, this is what is going on. So there is plenty of new OERs coming out. Um, we are involved in many different initiatives, in many different projects here at the EU, uh, but also in the global level. And we see that this is really expanding. Now the problem, uh, so next click. Uh, the problem is that uh, those OERs are in various isolated sites. They're in different modalities, the various formats, language diversity. I mean, everything which is there is mostly in English, but still there are plenty of OER elements that we are not looking at and not using because they are in different other languages. There's a various formats. So you have everything, can you go, uh, so sorry. Uh, various formats, so everything from from uh, textual to PDFs to, to pictures, uh, movies, and all this stuff. We don't know about the rights, which are very, whether these rights are there uh, and when the proper, um, proper licenses are assigned to, to this content. And in most cases, you have dead links, different languages of quality. And so uh, when you talk to, to people, and in particular the teachers who are actually also the creators of OER and ask them, so why are you not using OERs? They will tell you, well, those are the things, this is why I'm not using OERs. So now when we, when we saw this and when we discussed about these issues years ago already, we, and since we are involved in the development of various, uh, various algorithms from the, from the broad range of artificial intelligence, we find out that the most of these cases can be actually solved uh, with the AI that we have. So next slide. So for example, uh, some of the things that we already do, and I can bring in as a value to, to, and to, to grasp the OER problems, so it actually is a, that uh, it's very easy to gather content, to do content cleaning, to do the content structure, and this is independent on modality. So could be in any type of modality, could be in any type of language, any type of uh, alphabet. Uh, we do, and you know that, and you're using that already. So we do automatic translation and we do cultural adaptation because we are able to understand uh, what is the background knowledge that actually is then um, uh, influencing the, the, the content or the services of OER. Then on the other side, we do contextualization, adaptation to personal needs and preferences. So this personalized learning, uh, uh, non-intrusive contextualized learning. There is quite a lot of uh, work you, you know already, which is about learning analytics and user modeling. So on one side, understanding content, on the other side, understanding users would actually mean that you can do personalized learning. But there are also other stuff that we do, and those are the things that actually the, um, are at the edge right now in the research in the particular in the area of artificial intelligence is about not just about processing content but also understanding content and since you are able to understand content next click then you can do and you create something which will be let's say a kind of a global open ai teacher that will on one side learn from from content on the web learn from content from people and then actually provide everything in a structured way back back to the, uh, to the users. Next click. So uh, for example, this is what we do. Um, those are the things that we are doing already. So there is a service running, which actually automatically ingest, clean, fuse, and pre-process OER content. So everything that was said at the first, uh, at the first second slide with, with the challenges, are being partly solved already with something which is the pipeline like this. Uh, so on one side, we are collecting all this information and then we are trying to, uh, to use all these technologies that we have to understand, to structure and to properly, uh, properly uh, force the, uh, the, the content, the OER into something that would be then useful for others to use. Now, the other part, which, which is 
not there yet, but we have some prototypes ready is about how to process the quality. How can you actually provide out of all these big chunks of materials saying that those materials are, are you know, better prepared or of higher quality than the others. So kind of a ranking mechanism. And then on the other side, on the, on the fourth side is that actually the, the issue about whether we can take out some more information, some more knowledge from what we are collecting across the globe, which is finding out what are the didactical and pedagogical uh, elements inside this OER. So those are the things that certainly can help. And if, if we are able as a community to, to, to develop such a kind of a mechanism and make it open and transparent for anybody to openly use, then we have provided actually a highway for the developers of any type of application on the top of the collection of OER. And this is the live stream. So this is the live stream of information that is actually being collected across the globe. Next slide. Uh, so this is what we also do. So click once more, please. And once more. So this is what we also do. So um, we are uh, now trying to put things together in something which would be a more comprehensive, comprehensive environment. So it's not just about uh, collecting OERs, it's about the understanding what is going on on the global education. So what is going on on the level of all the elements in education, not just about content, but also policies, also models, also learning behaviors, everything what can be accessed there to put in something which will be a digital twin for a global education and situation awareness system. And we have a prototype now that is actually able to provide some inputs to policies as well. So it's not just about creating um, and assessing materials which are there, but it's also about using all, what, all this, using all this information that we are, we could collect and it's available to provide something more than just a pipeline of the OER materials. Next slide, please. And, and since we are able to do that, of course, and this is what I said already about the AI teacher, what we what we are what we have already is a prototype, um, and, and there are several prototypes. So it's not just ours. There are many others as well, which are now uh, you know you have an AI that is actually automatically learning. It's learning from the web. Ne click next click. It's learning from people, so asking question, getting information, and then providing everything to to everybody. So it's a kind of a global. AI open source software that is on one side collecting information, structured information, put it information in knowledge and providing back to the user in a personalized way. Next slide. So what if we will really we be able to, cr to create this kind of a pipeline? So on one side, understanding content, so automatic ingest and cleaning fusion, the, the one I show you already. On the other side, understanding users, user modeling, user understanding, social and auto modeling. So if we know two things, and if we understand what are the perceptions, what are the needs, what are the preferences of each particular individual, we can create the career path. And then when you have the career path, you can actually create something which will be an adaptive learning environment for every and each individual. So it's more ju just about the OER, it's about putting all these bits and pieces, and those are already developed, um, developed software elements that are, that are being used in several applications into something which would be a comprehensive view, a comprehensive use of the global knowledge. And it's actually a transformation from what we are looking at today as an educational system, something which is educational system that is adapted to each particular individual. Next slide, please. And of course, it's more than just about this. So we are able to calculate competencies. Just go next slide one. Next one. This is just to show you how we do that. Next one. Then since we, are, we know on one side, you've seen, we understand the OER, we have collected OER and we understand the user. Then we can create learning pathways. This is already 
uh, running. So here we are, collect, we are creating learning pathways for each particular individual based on what are their preferences and on one side what, avail, what are the OER available. Next slide. We, can, we are playing with micro-credentials and qualifications. So here where AI comes in, of course, is when you do, when you do automatic matching between uh, competency standards globally. You have many competency standards which are not matched. So if you would have today a micro-credentials or credentials password, you cannot really go to the country X and this will be automatically translated. So this is what we, we also do with AI. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, and uh, so what I wanted to say is actually there are many things that AI can solve. What I, I'm always preaching is that we are, you know, using AI for years now in, in uh, smart cities, in intelligent cars, in intelligent environments, in whatever sort of, of, um, of dom human domains, but we did quite few things on learning. And this, those are the things that we are now developing that not just us, so it's, it's a global community. They are available. It's not that this would be um, prototypes. It's actually a real software. And is the aim of it is that this would be available to anybody to easily overcome all the challenges that has been set up in the, in the second slide. So this is briefly what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitya. So as we can see from this presentation, there is a lot of work that we can think of in terms as we develop the projects further in the working groups where we can incorporate a lot of things in order to ensure that they can be very forward looking. With that, I give the floor to Alexi Carr, who's uh, joining us from Vancouver. So it's some like 2.30 in the morning for her, but she's here to speak on uh, on monitoring and the importance of monitoring when the activities. Alexi, please. Hi, thank you, Zainab. Um, yes, as Zainab mentioned, it is quite late for early here for me, so um, I'll keep it brief. Also, too, knowing that we we have limited time and there's a few other agenda items to get through. Um, so Zainab's earlier presentation uh, pointed out that the purpose of these consultations over the next few days would be to identify um, some possible actions going forward. So given that we're in these early stages of still discussing the possible actions, I'll just focus on a few broad points that are relevant to monitoring at this stage. Um, so basically looking essentially at why monitoring will be important moving forward and what we can keep in mind during our discussions. Um, so as you know, monitoring is positioned as one of the transversal themes, which cuts across the four thematic working groups of the coalition. Um, in broad terms, the monitoring serves uh, three purposes, essentially. So first of all, uh, it's going to help us to determine if we're on track to achieve what we set out to achieve. Uh, so this is generally the accountability or performance measurement kind of mechanism or function of the monitoring. Um, secondly, it's about informing improvement, right? So if we have a sense of whether we're meeting our objectives or not, um, then we can move forward and determine how to course correct or adjust accordingly. And then lastly, monitoring is important from an evidence standpoint. Um, so a lot of the earlier discussions, we've talked about this idea of research and how it's going to be key for evidence-based advocacy efforts. Um, so obviously monitoring, that's a, a mechanism for getting data that can really inform this kind of uh, research, which is valuable for advocacy. So in this early stage, as we begin to think in more detail about some of the uh, proposed activities or intended results, it's important to think through not just the immediate outputs, but also some of the outcomes and impact that are envisioned. Um, and as well as this, the relevant indicators that we might use to track progress. So the earlier discussions in March, which have been referred to previously, um, they generated a number of possible indicators for each of the thematic uh, areas. And these have been summarized in the final report on the OER Dynamic Coalition. So if you haven't had a chance to read through that, uh, that would be a very useful document to refer to. Um, these indicators covered both qualitative and quantitative indicators. 
both of which are important. So the quantitative uh, tends to be easier to collect, but the qualitative gives um, a bit more depth and, and richer information. Um, at the output level, some of the indicators raised in those earlier sessions were, for example, number of OER, number of repositories, number of capacity building solutions. Um, towards the outcome level, indicators related to usage and adoption were raised. So for example, number of users adapting OER to their context, number of countries that have produced action plans for sustainability, overall adoption of OER in education systems. Uh, the report also presents some suggested indicators related to impact of OER on teaching and learning. Um, so specifically on behavior change, uh, changes to practice and learning outcomes as well. Um, and so another main point that emerged in those earlier discussions, which I think is relevant uh, as we move ahead over the next few days, um, is the importance of focusing on this entire value chain of results. Um, so from outputs to impact, as well as considering the multiple stakeholders that may benefit in different ways from uh, the proposed actions. So yeah, to, to wrap up, basically, as we begin discussions over the next three days, I think it will be very helpful to just really think through in a bit more detail some of the intended outputs and outcomes of the activities that we identify, um, as well as how these link to the overall objectives and the recommendations, um, and to start to think about the indicators as well. So this helps to establish a shared uh, initial understanding of objectives, which will be key. And I will be participating in working groups four and two because of some of the uh, time zone challenges, but um, I'm happy to discuss with anyone from any of the other groups if you don't happen to be in either of those two sessions. So thank you very much. And I'll pass it thank back to you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexi. That's really very clear and very precise. Um, we have gotten over the problem of space. Now it's a problem of time that we are having trouble with, I think. But uh, with that, I give the floor to Neil, who's going to who's the chair for communications, and he'll be talking about the communication strategy and how to go forward in this area. Neil, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. As uh, Zeynep has mentioned, my name is Neil Butcher. I'm from OER Africa which is an initiative uh, that's working predominantly in the higher education sector in Africa, supporting the Association of African Universities and the African Librarians Association, amongst others, to help to try to uh, foster effective OER practices. Um, and by that, I mean practices that uh, OER, that, that harness the use of OER to improve the quality of teaching and learning uh, in our educational institutions on the continent. Uh, I'm stressing that point just as by way of introduction to the communication strategy because I think that in many respects um, that's going to be one of the key challenges that we face uh, as we engage in the work of the key working groups is not only to think about um, the actual initiatives and projects of each of the different working groups but also to think about how the, the way in which we share information with key stakeholders associated with the OER recommendation helps them to understand how to solve that problem. In other words, how to integrate uh, effective use of OER into their policies, into their practices, in ways that really improve the quality of the teaching and learning experience of our students. Um, so obviously the communication strategy uh, is going to be, although it's cross-cutting across all the working groups, uh, I think it's going to be a critical aspect of the success of those working groups because to date, although we would um, love to, to believe otherwise, the sad reality is that still the concept of OER and its integration into educational policies, particularly at the government level, but also to a significant extent in educational institutions, is very much still on the margins. So while it will be important for us to do good work, it's also going to be really important to find ways to reach out across the globe and make sure that key stakeholders like governments, like donors, like inst educational institutions and other key decision makers understand what the OER recommendation is really all about and understand in very clear, practical and simple terms how they can integrate OER practices into their own work and into their own policies uh, in ways that will achieve those educational goals. Um, so in simple terms, the goal of the communication strategy at the moment is to create awareness of the OER recommendation itself, to raise public awareness of the relevance and potential benefits of OER adoption, 
to ensure that all stakeholders have a full understanding of the relevance of the recommendation and to encourage its implementation. And then very importantly, to collect and disseminate progress, good practices and innovations related to OER use and policy supporting OER. I think that area is going to be particularly important to integrate into the working groups um, because I think if we can give people from a communications perspective a clear and, and grounded and practical understanding of how they can do these things through uh, illustrative examples, that will be a very powerful mode of communication. Also then to facilitate community engagement with the OER recommendation and policy development, we obviously want to make sure that the dynamic coalition is not a one-way conversation from UNESCO to others, but that it facilitates ongoing interaction and discussion amongst the key stakeholders. And lastly, to encourage sustainable business models and launch funding strategies to support OER use, um, which will come down the line. So in the communication strategy so far, we've identified a number of target audiences that I've sort of spoken about in very general terms. And then we've identified some initial kinds of uh, activities that we think may help with communication and may support the dissemination of the knowledge coming from the working groups. Um, there, there's nothing particularly surprising about the ideas that we've uh, flagged so far. Uh, things like providing templates, adaptable resources and video tutorials, sharing lessons learned, success stories and best practices, creating easily digestible strategies for and examples of policy development and implementation, including sample policy frameworks and toolkits, and so on and so on. And of course, um, uh, it was always anticipated that the communication strategy would have a very strongly focused digital component uh, using online technologies and portals to, uh, as key mechanisms for that dissemination. And that's obviously something we've all learned uh, much faster as a consequence of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but I think that some of those changes will be lasting even once we've managed to get that under control. Um, but of course, uh, uh, over time, hopefully the communication strategy will also be able to reintroduce face-to-face -face engagements and events um, to bring people together and give them the opportunity to meet and discuss. Uh, for the communication strategy so far, we haven't really got into detail because what we're expecting is that the results of discussions taking place over the next couple of days will provide a basis for informing how the communication strategy should move forward and be implemented. So as Zenep has mentioned, I will be functioning uh, as a rapporteur with my colleague Mahini in each of the working group sessions. Uh, and as part of that, in addition to recording the results of the discussions, we will also be extracting from that ideas that can inform a more detailed and concrete communication strategy, which we will share with all of the members of the dynamic coalition so that you can get, you'll be able to provide your inputs at that stage. So that's really where we're headed with the communications working group. Um, like Alexis's, Alexis's working group, this is a cross cutting one, um, but I hope you'll agree that communication um, from, through, and, and, and across all the working groups is going to be critical to the success of the OER recommendation, both to raise awareness and to make sure that the way in which it's implemented is actually achieving its educational goals. Thank you, Zenith. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, as you can see, we started this project on the 2nd of March, and since then, a lot has changed in the world. And the one thing that has come very clearly across is that uh, digital communication is, um, is paramount right now. And uh, we will have to find ways of moving forward that are innovative and that are accessible. I would like to add one point to uh, to the discussions. Um, for the work of the OER Dynamic Coalition, there is there are some principles which are inside the recommendation and which many of you have underscored in the discussions to make this recommendation a reality that we really insist are maintained in the, uh, in the work and that's the of, uh, gender equality of multi uh, multi multi secularism and multilingualism and also of uh, gen geographic balance so while we're doing this and in this digital framework you will see that um, there is uh, there is uh, you'll see for example that we have more participation from more people from different parts of the world thanks to the digital framework and we have more participation from women particularly thanks to the digital uh, exchange so we have to see as a community how we can move forward and capitalize on this and even 
make use the strength of this diversity in making something a project work collective uh, experience which is very uh, very innovative now we've talked a lot uh, we'd like to invite uh, open floor to discussion we can go over a little bit if you if you want so don't feel that we have to speak too quickly but I would like to open the floor if you want to raise a point, please raise your hand or put something in the question and response. The reason we're not using the conversation, the chat button in these discussions is because it's too, there are too many people here for us to be able to ensure uh, organized discussion if there are, uh, with the number of people that we have involved in the project, in the project, in the meeting itself. So I open the floor. Are there any questions? Anybody wants to take the floor? In the question response box, um, there are uh, there have been questions that were brought up. One of them was that in the slide which I showed you, there was a mix up between the numbers of the working groups on terms of Friday. So as you know, the the the, uh, the one on Friday is on capacity building, and is working group one, not four. Uh, question about the chat. That's uh, and that we will share the slides. Um, there is a question from uh, uh, Gemma, uh, and it's to Michia. How important and possible do you think it is to recommend users to use open formats beyond open licenses to create uh, OER? I'm reading it out loud, so there is interpretation. And the response from Michia was that it of course is possible we are automatically detecting already what type of license is assigned to a particular content. What we are doing today is categorizing content based on these detected licenses and just the ones which have the proper license. We are flagging the others. So we are collecting also content where license is not clear that can be further resolved directly to the career. So the, that's what there. I see that there's another question. Uh, Igor writes, thank you. question to Zainab. Would it be possible to provide some insights on how many types of participants are on this call and how many signed up for different working groups? Uh, yes, but not scientifically because we, have, uh, we haven't made the tables, but we will provide that after the meeting when we, have, uh, when we finish the, um, the discussions and we will do an analysis by uh, by gender and by region. And I think that uh, Neil would also answer this question. Neil, go ahead. Um, I was just going to add that uh, I will make sure that all of that information is contained in the final report, um, which we will obviously circulate to everyone. Ah, we have a hot question from Saad Azubri. Um, what about cybersecurity? Hmm. Is that's the most important topic while moving to the digital world? Can I open the floor to? And there's another question here from Stian and from Cable, and then from there I will open the floor to the panelists. So, uh, from Christian, thank you. Is there already a commitment by national UNESCO member states to use the qualitative and quantitative indicators for OER? If not, what can we do to achieve it? And from table, will the participants in each working group have communications to work with, share knowledge with each other, listserv, Zoom rooms, online docs, etc.? Um, can I answer while I've got the microphone? Can I answer that? Give my input to the three questions, and then I'll give the floor to panelists. Oh, there's more. Oh, there's one more. Uh, I didn't. I don't. I didn't fully understand if Mitya's research is funded on a national or international level. Is it OER Slovenia? Or an international institution that supports the research on AI and OER. Okay, I will I will answer the ones that I have. And uh, in terms of cybersecurity, it's an issue that we will have to address. And in the document itself, in the recommendation, there is a talk of data protection, which was put in there specifically by a number of our states. And it's definitely a very important topic as we move more and more into the digital world. And I will ask my panelists also to provide insight to that. In terms of commitment by national member states to use qualitative and quantitative indicators for OER, um, what there is is a commitment to do monitoring based on the text of the recommendation. And that is to monitor progress on the use of uh, on the implementation of the recommendation. In terms of quantitative and qualitative indicators, first of all, we have to figure out exactly what and 
how and why. We'll have to see in terms of the work that we do in the OER Dynamic Commission Coalition, we will have to um, first decide what we're doing and then see how going to measure it and monitor it. So that is something that is going to be a work progress in terms of national commitments. There are national commitments that is available on the, in the recommendation and it's the section on monitoring, which is the final section of the recommendation, which is available on the um, cable. In terms of the working groups, uh, we will be working on uh, we, the basis of the discussions are within those two days and it's going to be on the uh, in, during the discussions and we will come up with the outcomes during that discussion and share with all this is these working these online consultations are for the period which they are in order to produce the result which we have said and we will not be uh, we will be doing the work at present time during the conversations. Um, in terms of Micha's research, I give the floor to um, to Charlotte, uh, sorry, to Micha, and I see there's a further question, and we'll answer the last question after. Uh, Micha, uh, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, uh, of course. So I'm, I'm also typing down this. Uh, uh, so uh, more or less, whatever we do is more or less uh, supported and fin uh, financed by the international projects. So on one side, this would be European Commission projects and uh, the, I would just type you in uh, the link to one of those as an example. So uh, with AI is like this. So in um, we, we are involved in different sorts of, uh, of research and development with different domains. So everything, as I said, from from smart cities to, to cybersecurity as well. But more or less all bits and pieces that we're developing are fitting into the same uh, code library. And we are using this code library now to, to create this pipeline of uh, technologies that I, I actually presented. This is number one. Number two is that we, uh, since we uh, set up a newly, the first AI, UNESCO AI International Research Center at our institute recently, now the, the work on on AI education is being um, uh, is started there. So the ones I've shown, the, the one of the slides I've shown, which is the digital twin of the country of the globe, th this is actually being now developed inside uh, under the umbrella of this UNESCO Air Research Center. And this is not just Slovenia, is not just our institution, it's international, it's international team of experts. Thank you, Misha. Uh, Alexi, would you like to provide some inputs? Alexi, are you here? I think we might have lost Alexi. Yeah, I'm here, Zainab, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, in, yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, you, please. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of the questions that were posed, I think um, you've addressed quite well the one that's linked to the monitoring. So um, just that distinction between the um, monitoring that's outlined in the recommendations um, versus, you know, what will be established within the actual coalition based on the discussions um, that occur in the activities that are proposed. So we're still very much at the early stages of, of um, developing, you know, ideas for the activities and then we can move forward with the um, actual qualitative and quantitative indicators. Okay, thank you, Alexi. Neil, would you like to uh, add anything? Um, maybe just as an add-on to your responses to Cable, uh, I think it's also just useful, Cable, to differentiate between this phase where we're, the, the, the chairs of the working groups are really just tasked with assembling strategies for each working group. Um, which then UNESCO will consolidate into an overall plan for the dynamic coalition. Um, and then the, the later implementation, uh, as I mapped out with the, uh, with the communication strategy, once we get into that implementation phase, obviously there's also going to then be a, a range of communication tools that, that uh, people are involved in the dynamic coalition and the work of the OER recommendation will be able to use to work with and share knowledge with one another. That's going to be a central aspect of the success of implementation, I think. So this is just the initial first phase as per Zenep's slides uh, that she shared earlier. I hope that makes sense. 
Okay, and I think uh, Gabor has left us, so I cannot ask him. Uh, Gaspar, are you there? No, I don't think so. Yes. Oh, you're here. Okay, do you want to add anything? Uh, I had a call, <laughs> so sorry. Okay, so shall we move on? Um, okay. So Zenith, there's just a couple of questions that people are asking about how they can make inputs um, yes. outside of the individual sessions if they're not able to participate in them due to time zone differences. Right, yes, I saw that. Um, I would propose that what we do is that I send after this message, I send the message to the Dynamic Coalition with, an, uh, with a mechanism which I will uh, identify clearly in the message on where you can send your inputs to the sessions uh, during the, uh, by in writing if you can't physically be there. Now, I just want, I think I should go systematically through it so that we make sure we address everything. So, Leo Hefman, so thanks to all the speakers, and I'm reading it out loud because I want to make sure that it's also interpreted into French. Thanks to all the speakers for this fascinating introduction. Some mention was made of the results of consultation and survey that has already taken place. I wonder if these results are available for us to consider in advance of the working group meeting. Yes, they are and I'll send them out after this meeting. Congratulations to the Dynamic Coalition on progress on the OER recommendations far. A practical question, how do you envisage input during the discussion consultation from times that do not coincide with the synchronous meeting sessions? Uh, I think we're going to have to find a way of doing that, sending in the participation. Uh, if you cannot attend the discussions, it's the same, but we can't age in the decision-making process of the working group. First of all, just to make it clear, we had already opened up all the, all the areas of discussion for a one-week survey. Actually, it went on for uh, more than a week, um, about 10 days, there was an open survey, and we invited the entire dynamic coalition to send their inputs, and the basis of the discussions in the working groups are your inputs to this survey. And so if you did not get a chance to answer this survey, uh, we cannot open it again right now because it's too, uh, it's too complicated to do uh, at this late stage, but we will send a link, a way, a means for you to send inputs to the working groups. And uh, from Mr. Jose Bonino, in terms of sustainability and localization of OERs, how is it possible to collaborate with local partners? I think that's going to be a very important question, and I think it should be something which will be addressed inside the working groups. I will leave it also to my colleagues in the, uh, in the, on the panel to address this one also. Hi, Zane. Thanks for another great opportunity. Learning curve. Is it possible for us to thrash out the residual residu issue of the aborted work. This is referring to another workshop um, that was done uh, with uh, Nigeria and I will get back to Chris on this. Um, Christians, by the way, I cannot see all questions as answered. I did see a Cable's comment. It's there. It's, uh, it's the last one before Leo Hevman's comment at 11.51. Cable's wrote at 11.49. So I open the floor. Could I, uh, are there any uh, can I uh, give the floor perhaps to Alexi? Do you have any inputs? Hi, Zainab. Um, no, I don't have anything specific. Um, I think you've kind of addressed those questions on the point of sustainability and localization of OERs. I think, as you noted, it makes sense for that to, to be fleshed out a bit in those um, the working group sessions that are coming up. Okay. And uh, Misha, do you have anything? Uh, sorry, sorry, Zeynep, I was busy on typing and answering questions in the chat. So what was the, uh, what well, was the answer? Do you have any, do have any inputs to any of the questions that we just threw? I, I'm, I'm typing in. Could you please uh, read it out loud? Because we need to uh, make sure that it's inputted. So where it goes. So if I answer them, it goes. Resol resol resolved. Uh, answered. Uh, 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 so there was a question about, uh, so let me, um, there was a question about, um, uh, I'm completely lost, I cannot see now where, where my answer went. Um, 
So there was a question about the cybersecurity. So uh, cybersecurity, it's of course, it's important now uh, in respect to the OER. So cybersecurity is important for the process, the process which would be open education. Now for the OER, the importance of the cybersecurity is particularly at the level of, let's say, fake content, fake news type, type of, of issues. So uh, there are some mechanisms that we are developing in particularly for the for, de for detecting uh, suspicious content, which would be something which we are not sure about whether this is true or not. But then um, in, in this respect, uh, we are now uh, playing with the model of human in the loop uh, so that we are actually uh, uh, learning how, how experts, uh, in particular for journalists, now I'm saying for the journalists, and that can be then used for OER as well, are uh, are uh, looking and categorizing uh, the news whether if this is a fake or uh, not really proper uh, proper news so um, the model we are testing is there uh, for the cyber security as such of course this is an issue it is an issue that goes on the level of the uh, as i said on the process of of education when when there there could be any type of breaches and so for that, uh, certainly there are already existing solutions. Uh, what we are doing, if you are interested in, uh, of what we're doing in cybersecurity um, in, 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 a, in a global sense is that actually we are using AI now, not just to fight the cyber, cyber breaches, but also to, uh, to predict in advance potent potential breaches. And this is not the technical, but also the complete scenario of, of cybersecurity attacks. So those are the things we do for, for other domains, but certainly whatever we are developing, of course, can be, will be used in, in, the, in the open education as well. Uh, this was one question and the other was about, um, and I'm just answering it right now, I think. Um, uh, or is it uh, it's the last one? Thank. Can I the name of So f Wayne, Wayne was Wayne was uh, putting the question about the. Um, so congratulations to the dynamic coalition team on progress on the OER recommendations so far. A practical question: How do you envision using during the discussion consultations from time zones that are not coincident with the synchronous sessions? So. So what we do now is a kind of a combination with, between the offline and online. Uh, but certainly this is the point that should be, should be addressed and uh, we should find out the solution that this would be on one spot uh, under one umbrella and uh, uh, mixing both. Okay, thank you. Um, Neil, do you have any inputs? No, nothing further from my side. Oh. Okay, Gashfer, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, Gashfer, are you there? Okay, I think we might have lost Gashfer. Um, just uh, as you can see, see if we have any further questions. Let me see. Uh, I don't think we do, but let me see. Uh, I think that synchron uh, there seems to be a problem with synchronization. Uh, thanks for uh, synchronization. We'll check. Leo's comment, I read it out loud during the discussion. It's, it's ordered to local time on the machine. Okay, I think that brings us to the last point, which I think is important to note. This is uh, one of the first times that we're doing a Zoom with interpretation, and we just need to uh, have some bugs to iron out, but we're, I think it's, um, it's a way forward. One, and it does address the objectives of ensuring as, as much as possible inclusivity in terms of language and, uh, and time zone, and not time zones, but place. And now we have to deal with time. So we've got uh, we've got the geographic issue now, but not the time issue. So what we have, uh, if there are no further questions, what I pose is that uh, we will we will send 
a response concerning a means to in provide inputs to the working groups that are on the uh, that you may not be able to attend because of time because of time constraints and uh, in, in the next hour or so uh, through the list of part that received the invitation to this uh, event and we will um, we will continue the session. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and we look very much forward to your inputs to the discussions to come and realize that this is uh, perhaps a new way of discussing and we have deconstructed this intellectual exchange that we would do face to face in, a, in most in circumstances earlier, but this is where we are and we have to move forward and find innovative ways of doing what we did better than, than the way we did them before using the technology at hand. And with that, I'd like to thank you, thank the panel for your inputs. And the next session is the same place, uh, at time this afternoon at uh, 4.30 CET. And it will be on sustainability and it will be uh, shared by Ms. Jihan Osman, who's the chair for the sustainability issue. I'm sorry, not Jihan, I'm sorry, but Lisa Petridis and Tel Emil, who are the chairs for sustainability. Thank you very much and see you hopefully this afternoon if you can't and if, if you can, and if you can't, we'll send a means to send inputs to this discussion further to the inputs that you already sent using the survey. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.